Welcome to India Talks, a program brought to you by QTV, a channel for decision makers, and IndoIndians.com, the community portal for Indians in Indonesia. We are indeed privileged and honored to have with us Her Excellency Mrs. Navrekha Sharma here with us today. She's the ambassador of India to Indonesia. And she has been here since June this year. And we are indeed really honored to be learned from her all about Indians and India here in Indonesia. Welcome to our show, Mrs. Sharma. Thank you. Thank you, Puna. You've been here. This is your second assignment here in Indonesia. What drew you to Indonesia? Uh, the first time? The or first the second time? time? The second time. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I was uh, happy to come here the first time because uh, it was, it's, it's, a, it's a very important country, yeah. first of all. It's a neighbor. It's a big neighbor. And it is a country with a lot of uh, uh, diversity, a lot of interest in many f in f at many levels yes. for an Indian. So um, that was, uh, that was uh, the reason why I... I sought this posting actually the oh. first time, yes. And uh, well, the second time, I guess uh, my my government uh, probably thought that since I had some experience here, uh, it would be good. And the country had changed in the meanwhile. In the last ten years, a lot of changes have taken yes, place. Yes, political here. changes have taken That's place. That's right. And changes have taken place in India as well, in our outlook, in our reach, in, in the in the economic scope of our relations. So it seemed like a good idea perhaps for the government to send somebody who was familiar with the country to some extent to send that person back. So this was it. You are in a privileged position to know more about mo the Indian community here in Indonesia. What, do you, what are your views of the Indian community here? Um, well, they are a very big community although it's not very certain how big oh. you know i keep getting di diverse figures don't really have an authentic uh, fix on it yet but the range is some 40 50000 if you take into account all people of indian origin including the people who are citizens in indonesia that's right yeah yeah the number who are indian passport holders are of course about a tenth of that so um, so it's a large community, reasonably large, and it has been here over many uh, generations. Uh, it has been coming here in waves associated with different walks of life. There's a pattern about it. Uh, the, the wave that came here in the 1970s, uh, these were the investors, you know, the steel, the textile magnates, these are the people with the money about whom perhaps it, they are better known. But there were earlier waves as well, plantation workers in Medan, uh, people with the milk, you know, dairy farmers. So we have a big variety of Indian community. The dairy farmers is a new thing because I did know about textiles and steel, etc. But yeah. I was not aware of the dairy yeah. farmers that you just mentioned. Well, so you see, they came, they came when the Dutch opened Medan to plantations I and see. at that time the Dutch needed milk they are milk drinking people which Indonesians are not, not yes so the nearest uh, source of milk that they could get or people who knew about milk or could provide them with freshly farmed milk were Indian. Indians I see so uh, a whole really community of Punjabi dairy farmers oh. also settled in Medan <laughs> yes that's you learn something new every day yes yes about now that India is growing as a big economic power in, on the world global stage, how do you see Indonesia and India relations changing in the next five or ten years? Well, I think um, after that first initial uh, uh, burst of enthusiasm in Bandung, you know, represented by the Bandung Conference 1955, uh, after which, unfortunately, because of the Cold War and maybe also because our own policies were more inward looking in India, we didn't actually follow through on a lot of those promises. So I, I see the stage now 
after Indonesia became democratic, after India has opened out with its look east policy. I see that the stage is now set to realize the vision of Bandung, I you see. know, of 1955. Yeah. That is to say, as two major developing countries, countries which have had a history of colonization, countries which are fiercely na independent, yes. proud of their own very diverse cultures. And very uh, similar cultures very also. Very similar cultures, uh, pluralistic, holding many religions, proud of that as well. These are, and, and countries with a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, creative people, a lot of natural and human potential, but uh, still very much uh, developing countries. Yeah. Uh, these uh, have to come together. There is no, is, there is no, there is no denying that. Denying that. We, are, uh, we are close neighbors. Um, we are actually neighbors, you know, direct neighbors. There is a direct maritime boundary. And at the closest point of contact, we are only 70 kilometers apart. <laughs> that's which is that's uh, like really close, isn't yeah, it? Yes, that is. Yes. So, so, so there is there is a huge future ahead for us now that all the obstacles have been removed in the sense that the ideology is no longer playing a role. We have we have started looking outwards. We are trading a more and more with the world. The Indian economy is opening up. And, uh, and Indonesia has become likewise democratic. It's a country which is no longer fettered by its own government. Uh, so, so there's absolutely no, no uh, dearth of opportunities and which can, can now be explored. And it can be seen by a lot of new Indian companies coming into Indonesia. That's right. That's right. A lot of new Indian companies are beginning to take an interest in Indonesia again. As I say, the 1970s, there was a push factor at work which brought companies like the Mittals or like Indorama, you know, textile companies. They came because India was not allowing them to grow. You know, we had put caps on our companies' growths. We sell uh, buffalo meat. I don't know if you're aware of this, but buffalo meat is one of our big sellers, an Indian uh, product. Comes as quite a surprise. Though. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, a lot of it goes to the West, to West Asia and so on. But a lot of it comes here to Southeast Asia, to Malaysia, to the Philippines. You know, some $50 million worth of uh, meat comes to the Philippines, considerably more than that to Malaysia. Uh, every year, this is uh, frozen meat from buffalo, which is said to be more nourishing and protein rich even than beef. As you know, Indians don't eat yeah. beef, and that's not what I'm referring to. I'm talking of buffalo meat. And uh, these are meat-eating countries, uh, you know, not, uh, they don't eat lentils, their source of protein is meat. So one would actually expect Indonesia to be a, a ready market, because the meat that India sells is not only nutritious, but also cheap. So here again, we have problems of uh, non-tariff non barrier kind, which, uh, which I'm afraid, unless these, this kind of problem is uh, openly uh, discussed and then tackled, uh, we will find the impediments to trade and the, the basket of trade difficult to, um, you know, expand, to expand and to and grow. And grow. That's one major problem. And right now, the of the four billion dollars of trade, about a quarter is tr is uh, Indians exporting to Indonesia. Three quarters is Indonesia's mm. exports to India. Well, let's face it, Indian Indonesians have very large natural resources, so a yes. lot of them. But there again, there's another problem, and 